Section 8 of The Works of Edgar Allan Poe, Raven Edition, Volume 4. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Mystification by Edgar Allan Poe. Slid, if these be your pesados and montantes, I'll have none of them. Ned Knowles. The Baron Ritzner von Young was a noble Hungarian family, every member of which, at least as far back into antiquity as any certain records extend, was more or less remarkable for talent of some description. The majority for that species of grotesquerie in conception of which Teak, a scion of the house, has given a vivid, although by no means the most vivid, exemplifications. My acquaintance with Ritzner commenced at the magnificent Chateau Young, into which a train of droll adventures, not to be made public, threw a place in his regard and here, with somewhat more difficulty, a partial insight into his mental confirmation. In later days, this insight grew more clear, as the intimacy which had at first permitted it became more close, and when, after three years of the character of the Baron Ritzner von Young, I remember the buzz of curiosity which his advent excited within the college precincts on the night of the 25th of June, I remember still more distinctly that while he was pronounced by all parties at first sight the most remarkable man in the world, no person made any attempt at accounting for his opinion. That he was unique appeared so undeniable that it was deemed impertinent to inquire wherein the uniquity consisted. But letting this matter pass for the present, I will merely observe that from the first moment of his setting foot within the limits of the university, he began to exercise over the habits, manners, persons, purses, and propensities of the whole community which surrounded him, an influence the most extensive and despotic, yet at the same time the most indefinite and altogether unaccountable. Thus the brief period of his residence at the university forms an era in its annals, and is characterized by all classes of people appertaining to it or its dependencies as that very extraordinary epoch forming the domination of the Baron Ritzner von Young, then of no particular age, by which I mean that it was impossible to form a guess respecting his age by any data personally afforded. He might have been fifteen or fifty, and he was twenty-one years and seven months. He was by no means a handsome man, perhaps the reverse. The contour of his face was somewhat angular and harsh. His forehead was lofty and very fair, his nose a snub, his eyes large, heavy, glassy, and meaningless. About the mouth there was more to be observed. The lips were gently protruded, and rested the one upon the other, after such a fashion that it is impossible to conceive any, even the most complex combination of human features, conveying so entirely and so singly the idea of unmitigated gravity, solemnity, and repose. It will be perceived, no doubt, from what I have already said, that the Baron was one of those human anomalies, now and then to be found, who make the science of mystification the study and the business of their lives. For this science a peculiar turn of mind gave him instinctively the cue, while his physical appearance afforded him unusual faculties for carrying his prospects into effect. I quaintly termed the domination of the Baron Ritzner von Young ever rightly entered into the mystery which overshadowed his character. I truly think that no person at the university, with the exception of myself, ever suspected him to be capable of a joke, verbal or practical. The old bulldog at the garden gate would sooner have been accused, the ghost of Heraclitus, or the wig of the emeritus professor of theology. 
this too when it was evident that the most egregious and unpardonable of all conceivable tricks whimsicalities and buffooneries were brought about if not directly by him at least plainly through his intermediate agency or connivance the beauty if i may call it so of his art mystifique lay in that consummate ability resulting from an almost intuitive knowledge of human nature and a most wonderful self-possession by means of which he never failed to make it appear that the drolleries he was occupied in arose partly in spite and partly in consequence of the laudable efforts he was making for their prevention and for the preservation of the good order and dignity of alma mater the deep poignant the overwhelming mortification which upon each such failure of his praiseworthy endeavours would suffuse every lineament of his countenance left not the slightest room for doubt of his sincerity in the bosoms of even his most sceptical companions the adroitness too was no less worthy of observation by which he contrived to shift the sense of the grotesque from the creator to the created from his own person to the absurdities to which he had given rise in no instance before that of which i speak have i known the habitual mystific escape the natural consequence of his manoeuvres an attachment of the ludicrous to his own character and person continually enveloped in the atmosphere of a whim my friend appeared to live only for the severities of society and not even his own household have for a moment associated other things than those of the rigid and august with the memory of the baron ritzner von young the demon of the dolce far niente lay like an incubus upon the university nothing at least was done beyond eating drinking and making merry the apartments of the students were converted into so many pot-houses and there was no pot-house of them all more famous or more frequented than that of the baron our carousels here were many and boisterous and long and never unfruitful of events upon one occasion we had protracted our sitting until nearly daybreak and an unusual quantity of wine had been drunk the company consisted of seven or eight individuals besides the baron and myself most of these were young men of wealth of high connection of great family pride and all alive with an exaggerated sense of honour they abounded in the most ultra german opinions respecting the duello to these quixotic notions some recent parisian publications backed by three or four desperate and fatal conversation during the greater part of the night had run wild upon the all-engrossing topic of the times the baron who had been unusually silent and abstracted in the earlier portion of the evening at length seemed to be aroused from his apathy taking a leading part in the discourse and dwelt upon the benefits and more especially upon the beauties of the received code of etiquette in passages of arms with an ardour an eloquence an impressiveness and an affectionateness of manner which elicited the warmest enthusiasm from his hearers in general and absolutely staggered even myself who well knew him to be at heart a ridiculer of those very points for which he contended and especially to hold the entire fanfaronade of dueling etiquette in the sovereign contempt which it deserves looking around me during a pause in the baron's discourse of which my readers may gather some faint idea when i say that it bore resemblance to the fervid chanting monotonous yet musical sermonic manner of coleridge i perceived symptoms of even more than the general interest in the countenance of one of the party this gentleman whom i shall call herman was an original in every respect except perhaps in the single particular that he was a very great fool he contrived to bear however among a particular set at the university a reputation for deep metaphysical thinking and i believe for some logical talent as a duellist he had acquired who had fallen at his hands 
but they were many. He was a man of courage, undoubtedly. But it was upon his minute acquaintance with the etiquette of the duello and the nicety of his sense of honor that he most especially prided himself. These things were a hobby which he rode to the death. To Ritzner, ever upon the lookout for the grotesque, his peculiarities had for a long time past afforded food for mystification. Of this, however, I was not aware, although in the present instance I saw clearly something of a whimsical nature was upon the tapas with my friend, and that of Herman was its especial object. As the former proceeded in his discourse, or rather monologue, I perceived the excitement of the latter momently increasing. At length he spoke, offering some objection to a point insisted upon by R, and giving his reasons in detail. To these the baron replied at length, still maintaining his exaggerated tone of sentiment, and concluding in what I thought very bad taste with a sarcasm and a sneer. The hobby of Herman now took the bit in his teeth. This I could discern by the studied hair-splitting farrago of his rejoinder. His last words I distinctly remember. Your opinions, allow me to say, Baron von Young, although in the main correct, are in many nice points discreditable to yourself and to the university of which you are a member. In a few respects they are even unworthy of serious refutation. I would say more than this, sir, were it not for the fear of giving you offence. Here the speaker smiled blandly. I would say, sir, that your opinions are not the opinions to be expected from a gentleman. As Herman completed this equivocal sentence, all eyes were turned upon the baron. He became pale, then excessively red, then, dropping his pocket-handkerchief, stooped to recover it when I caught a glimpse of his countenance. While it could be seen by no one else at the table, it was radiant with the quizzical expression which was its natural character, but which I had never seen it assume except when we were alone together and when he unbent himself freely. In an instant afterward he stood erect, confronting Herman, and so total an alteration of his countenance in so short a period I certainly never saw before. For a moment I even fancied that I had misconceived him, and that he was in sober earnest. He appeared to be stifling with passion, and his face was cadaverously white. For a short time he remained silent, apparently striving to master his emotion. Having at length seemingly succeeded, he reached a decanter which stood near him, saying, as he held it firmly clenched, "'The language you have thought proper to employ, mine heir Herman, in addressing yourself to me, is objectionable in so many particulars that I have neither temper nor time for specification.' That my opinions, however, are not the opinions to be expected from a gentleman, is an observation so directly offensive as to allow me but one line of conduct. Some courtesy, nevertheless, is due to the presence of this company, and to yourself at this moment as my guest. You will pardon me, therefore, if, upon this consideration, I deviate slightly from the general usage among gentlemen in similar cases of personal affront. You will forgive me for the moderate tax I shall make upon your imagination, and endeavor to consider for an instant the reflection of your person in yonder mirror as the living Mynheer Herman himself. This being done, there will be no difficulty whatever. I shall discharge this decanter of wine at your image in yonder mirror, and thus fulfill all the spirit, if not the exact letter, of resentment for your insult, while the necessity of physical violence to your real person will be obviated. With these words he hurled the decanter full of wine against the mirror which hung directly opposite Herman, striking the reflection of his person with great precision and, of course, shattering the glass into fragments. The whole company at once started to their feet and, with the exception of myself and Ritzner, took their departure. As Herman went out, 
the baron whispered me that I should follow him and make an offer of my services. To this I agreed, not knowing precisely what to make of so ridiculous a piece of business. The duelist accepted my aid with his stiff and ultra recherche air, and, taking my arm, led me to his apartment. I could hardly forbear laughing in his face while he proceeded to discuss, with the profoundest gravity, what he termed the refinedly peculiar character of the insult that he had received. After a tiresome harangue in his ordinary style, he took down from his bookshelves a number of musty volumes on the subject of the duello, and entertained me for a long time with their contents, reading aloud and commenting earnestly as he read. I can just remember the titles of some of the works. There were the Ordnance of Philip Le Bel on Single Combat, the Theater of Honor by Favin, and a treatise on the permission of duels by Andiguer. He displayed also, with much pomposity, Brantherm's Memoirs of Duels, published at Cologne, 1666, in the types of Elsevier, a precious and unique vellum paper volume, with a fine margin and bound by de Rome but he requested my attention particularly, with an air of mysterious sagacity, to a thick octavo written in barbarous Latin by one Hedelin, a Frenchman, and having the quaint title, Duelli Lex Scripta et Non Alterique. From this he read me one of the drollest chapters in the world, concerning injure per applicationem per constructionem, et per se, about half of which he averred was strictly applicable to his own refinedly peculiar case, although not one syllable of the whole matter could I understand for the life of me. Having finished the chapter, he closed the book and demanded what I thought necessary to be done. I replied that I had entire confidence in his superior delicacy of feeling, and would abide by what he proposed. With this answer he seemed flattered, and sat down to write a note to the baron. It ran thus. Sir, my friend M. P. will hand you this note. I find it incumbent upon me to request, at your earliest convenience, an explanation of this evening's occurrences at your chambers. In the event of your declining this request, Mr. P. will be happy to arrange with any friend whom you may appoint the steps preliminary to a meeting. With sentiments of perfect respect, your most humble servant, Johann Hermann, to the Baron Ritzner von Young. Not knowing what better to do, I called upon Ritzner with this epistle. He bowed as I presented it, then with a grave countenance motioned me to have a seat. Having perused the cartel, he wrote the following reply, which I carried to Herman. Sir, through our common friend, Mr. P., I have received your note of this evening. Upon due reflection, I frankly admit the propriety of the explanation you suggest. This being admitted, I still find great difficulty, owing to the refinedly peculiar nature of our disagreement, and of the personal affront offered on my part, in so wording what I have to say by way of an apology, as to meet all the minute exigencies and all the variable shadows of the case. I have great reliance, however, on that extreme delicacy of discrimination in matters appertaining to the rules of etiquette, for which you have been so long and preeminently distinguished." With perfect certainty, therefore, of being comprehended, I beg leave, in lieu of offering any sentiments of my own, to refer you to the opinions of Sieur Hedelin, as set forth in the ninth paragraph of the chapter of Injure per Applicationem per Constructionem et per se, in his Duelli Lex Scripta et Non Alliterique.
the nicety of your discernment in all the matters here treated will be sufficient i am assured to convince you that the mere circumstance of me referring you to this admirable passage ought to satisfy your request as a man of honour for explanation with sentiments of profound respect your most obedient servant von young the heir johann hermann Herman commenced the perusal of this epistle with a scowl, which, however, was converted into a smile of the most ludicrous self-complacency as he came to the rigmarole about injure per applicationem per constructionem et per se. Having finished reading, he begged me, with the blandest of all possible smiles, to be seated, while he made reference to the treatise in question. Turning to the passage specified, he read it with great care to himself, then closed the book, and desired me, in my character of confidential acquaintance, to express to the Baron von Young his exalted sense of his chivalrous behavior, and, in that of second, to assure him that the explanation offered was of the fullest, the most honorable, and the most unequivocally satisfactory nature." Somewhat amazed at all this, I made my retreat to the baron. He seemed to receive Herman's amicable letter as a matter of course, and, after a few words of general conversation, went to an inner room and brought out the everlasting treatise Dueli Lex Scripta et non Eleutherique. He handed me the volume and asked me to look over some portion of it. I did so, but to little purpose, not being able to gather the least particle of meaning. He then took the book himself, and read me a chapter aloud. To my surprise, what he read proved to be the most horribly absurd account of a duel between two baboons. He now explained the mystery, showing the volume, as it appeared prima facie, was written upon the plan of the nonsense verses of Dubartus, that is to say, the language was so ingeniously framed so as to present to the ear all the outward signs of intelligibility, and even of profundity, while in fact not a shadow of meaning existed. The key to the whole was found in leaving out every second and third word alternately, where there appeared a series of ludicrous quizzes upon a single combat as practiced in modern times. The baron afterwards informed me that he had purposely thrown the treatise in Herman's way two or three weeks before the adventure, and that he was satisfied from the general tenor of his conversation, that he had studied it with deepest attention, and firmly believed it to be a work of unusual merit. Upon this hint he proceeded. Herman would have died a thousand deaths rather than acknowledge his inability to understand anything and everything in the universe that had ever been written about the duello. Littleton Berry End of Section 8